advise you that we have appointed Scott Horton to the executive board. That gets us an attorney on the board, and uh, so he started with us uh, last month. We have with us today uh, also the kid of Summerfield. We finally got a young Republican party going. <laughs> You want to stand up for everybody? Sure. And uh, <laughs> DJ Hale is the, uh, I think we were going to call him co sponsor, or co chair. <laughs> uh, we're certainly excited uh, to, to get them, and I want to thank the efforts of uh, Laura Lindsay, who's where? Yeah, her baby. Oh, baby had to leave. Laura Lindsay was here just a minute ago. She's the faculty sponsor for it at the uh, high school. So, uh, also we have uh, Shane Wilker with us, who's the commissioner of the 3rd District, right? Yes, sir. And anybody else am I leaving out? Mike Neal. Mike Neal. There you are. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Doing well. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh,
joining with the other about 17 or 18 governors and asking for a moratorium on the Syrian program. But we need a moratorium on the entire refugee resettlement program. Ultimately, the state needs to take it back away from private contractors who are mostly Catholic charities. There's a, a Lutheran organization that uh, brings refugees in. There's also one that's been opened by some refugees, some Somalis. We just need to shut those down. The state needs to take that program over again. And if you, as a citizen of the state, decide you want to bring refugees in and that you would rather have your money go to support refugees rather than native-born citizens, then you can make that decision. And we can vote for that in the budget. So that's the ultimate objective. I think we're heading that way. Um, it's taken a lot, long time to wake people up. It's probably going to take another disaster or catastrophe somewhere in the world, hopefully not too close, to finally wake everybody up to what's going on. But it is getting a little bit better on that front. The bilateral session of Congress, you've all heard me talk about it. It is moving forward. It's inching forward, but it's moving forward. Just this past Friday, we got the schedule for the second half of the 114th Congress in D.C. Now, if you remember, the bilateral session is when we're asking our nine representatives and our two U.S. senators to come and have an open political session with our House. And uh, so far, the state Senate doesn't want to participate in it. But the House has voted unanimously to participate in the bilateral session. January 19th is the day that I tentatively picked. It is a Tuesday when the entire U.S. Congress is off, and they're supposed to be back here for the week. And uh, so that's the date that I want to have it. To give you a prime example of the types of things we'll talk about, uh, Speaker Har Harwell and Speaker Ramsey issued a letter today to all 11 members of our federal Congress asking them to suspend the Syrian refugee program. These are the types of conversations we want to be able to have face-to-face, -face, not just a letter to a speaker. We want them to see that the entire body and the entire citizenry in the state of Tennessee is opposed to the refugee program. <coughs> we also want to be able to voice our opinion about a lot of other things, federal overreach um, by the Supreme Court, things that should that are in the Constitution that should be reserved for us. And we want to do it in a dignified way. We don't want our federal officials to feel like we're taking out 100% of our frustration on them because we do realize that they're, but just like I'm one vote out of 99, they're nine votes out of 435, so we get that. But we also want them every available opportunity to do whatever it takes to enable us to better govern ourselves here. And we want them to know what it is that we want done all the way down to the county level in Tennessee so that when they're in some meeting somewhere, they have to make a command decision about what's best for us. They know because we've already had this conversation. And it's not the first year that anybody ever is going to get mad at each other with this bilateral session of Congress, but it could be the subsequent years. If our federal legislators violate the spirit of the agreements that we set, or they choose not to participate with us, then the following year, I think we can take some, some steps against them to censor in some way, and we ultimately have the power as a state legislature redistrict our congressional seats every two years. So theoretically, if none of them want to meet with us, we could put all nine of them in one seat and uh, create a new back job. <laughs> but some of them do want to meet with us. Well, was the very first one that agreed to. His staff has been wonderful helping. Steve Cohen's agreed to participate with us. Fleischman, Chuck Fleischman has agreed, and Congressman Phil Rowe. We still have uh, Marshall Blackburn refused, Diane Black's refused. Jim Cooper is adamantly refused, and <coughs> Duncan has not yet approved to do it, nor has Fincher. And uh, it behooves me if our federal guys won't meet with us. That would be much like the Warren County Commission asking me to come in January and have a discussion about pertinent legislative issues that the county is concerned about that will be talked about in the state next fall or next spring, and me telling the county no. <coughs> you can't tell me to do that. Well, I would expect the process to fire me to begin pretty soon after that. So, But it's it's not all bad. We're making good progress. And, and we've got the schedule now. And we're moving forward. Um, what's happened over in Paris has woken a lot of people up. So it's a very, very busy time right now in Tennessee. 
financially, we're still in great shape. As I always say, it's the parent company we have to watch out for. U.S. goes broke, or if the Chinese currency becomes a reserve currency, there's all kinds of things. It doesn't matter how healthy we are in Tennessee, we're going to pay a, a terrible price. So my job is to fix all that bad stuff as much as I can to identify to educate people about it, to make sure that you get good speakers on the things that we're working on, to make sure that I educate myself so that I make the best decision I possibly can. And that is what I'm trying to do. And I appreciate the opportunity to do it. I know I hit a whole lot going on real fast, but uh, that's if you've listened to the news the last couple of days, that's other than the presidential debates, which uh, that's pretty much dominated it, what's happened over at Paris. But can I answer any questions for anybody? Or? Yes, sir. You've got a couple of them. Uh, first one on what you were hitting. What is the percentage, or is it kind of a ballpark percentage on these refugees or invaders, whatever you call them, of women and children compared to the young men that are coming in? Because it seems like an overabundance, so I don't know where the family situation is. And also, the latter one, what kind of reasons did some of these legislators give for back you're not wanting to participate in that. That's, that really bothers me. Okay, the, the first one about the, uh, I'm, I'm going to be speaking educated cases here, but most traditional refugees that come in, with the exception of this influx of potential Syrians, because we, they've not settled themselves out yet, most of them are about 50% men and about 50% women and children. Okay. Um, they're probably, of that total, I want to say 18 to 20 percent of them are under the age of 18, and 10 to 12 percent of them are over the age of 65. The vast majority of them are somewhere in the middle, um, working age, potentially productive people. That's the average number. What it appears, what's happening with the Syrian numbers, is that it's about two thirds male, and it's about one third women and children, and that most of the males seem to be of military age, um, fit for duty should be fighting for their country and uh, being encouraged to do some other things. But we don't know all that for sure. That's just reports we're getting. And then what are the reasons? The second question was, what are the reasons why some of our federal legislators don't want to participate in the bilateral session? <coughs> Almost exclusively, it's because they feel like that they're going to be belittled, that, the, that they don't have to answer to a state government, that we're separate branches of power. In my opinion, I believe that the state is pulling the power, and the federal government exists because of the states, and the local governments exist because of the states. It doesn't mean we want to run them out of existence. It means it's time to sit down and talk to us, because your power comes from us, and you're no longer you've lost that respect for that. It's time to get it. And we want the federal government to work with us on our behalf to divest Washington D.C. of control of the money. We don't want less money. We want more control of money than we have. We don't want to have to send so much to Washington first in the first place, and then we don't want to have to have so many cable ties attached to every guy that comes down here. We want to spend it the way we want. And we just have to start laying this out. And they hate it. They hate the idea of being told what to do. Our federal government. They don't want to be brought down here waiting for the four debt ceiling votes that they have not being able to ever stop Obamacare. But I pledge to them, that's not what we're going to do here. It's a blank slate. When we start that day, on January 19th, we're going to look at the issues that are before us between then and May. And, and what can we do right now today to begin slowing this train down? It's a matter of side question. Yes, sir? What's the latest on keeping our drivers tested station? Good question. We are battling, uh, Mayor Jimmy Haley was just, Mayor Jimmy Haley's done a heck of a job, number one. Both of our other uh, legislators from here have done a heck of a job. We have slowed the Department of Safety down dramatically. We have forced them into a, a negotiation, basically, where their answers, and, and I'm trying to say this with all due respect, but it's illogical. Their closure is illogical because it, it, the amount of money that they're going to save, which is roughly $75,000, is going to inconvenience the citizens of Warren County greatly in excess of $75,000. And that's so obvious that two major, um, kind of three actually, major alternatives have emerged. One, 
As the city and the county are actually actively working together to speak to the property owners of the current driver's license station to potentially reduce the rent a little bit and the city and the county pay the rent. That's the one thing. Um, to me, that, that <coughs> clearly accepts an unfunded mandate, so that would have to be a because the state's saying you must do these things, we're not going to provide the venue for you to do them. So the city, you either have to drive an hour or the city's forced to do it. So, but to keep it here, I think the city's willing to work with the county to come up with the money to keep that convenience here. That would be one opportunity. The second option is to restore it through the budgetary process. We're in a, a huge budget surplus right now. We have well over a billion dollars in cash reserves in Tennessee. Uh, this decision was made by the, at the discretion of the governor to cut about 3% out of the Department of Safety's budget. They decided it was going to be the lowest performing driving testing centers. We did not know that until after we voted on the budget. There's no reason in a budget where we have $907 million in excess to close five driving testing centers, saving $300,000 putting all these people out of way. So once we can make that legislative case, we have until technically until May 31st to get something done. We're afraid the state's going to try to pull the trigger real quick, maybe in February and get us out of there. So I'm hoping if we can at least stay at the end of February, that will give us time in the budgetary process to get this restored with enough certainty that they'll abandon the plans to move it. So that's one thing. Um, in the line with that same thing of thought, we have the, the troopers. Uh, we want the troopers to be able to have a safe and effective office here in Warren County. And uh, right now we're looking at alternative locations for the troopers in case we do lose the driver's testing center. And the 911 center has, has really stepped up and, and offered help with that as much as possible. And I've offered through the budgetary process <coughs> to try to get a little stipend to be able to have the troopers there so we don't lose them from being stationed in Warren County. The third thing, which I think is is, is as equally possible as the first two, and it's been completely left off the table, is that a Republican initiative was passed about four years ago that went through a lot of constitutional tests, and that is photo ID to vote, if you'll all remember. And one of, one of the things we had to swear up and down to the court, <coughs> to the opposition party, to all the non-believers, is that we would make it easy to get a photo ID. And that would include all the driver's license testing centers. They would be free of charge to be able to walk in there and get them. Now, if we turn around five years into that law, close five driver's testing centers, three of them in very rural areas, then we've just made it a true inconvenience for someone to get a photo ID, a government photo ID. And that's going to open that court battle up again. And once I'm able to make that case to my colleagues at home, I think that's going to be another potential that will work on. And that whole thing is just kind of that. <coughs> so that's where the whole thing is. Everybody on this end has worked really hard. And, and the industrial boards, the county mayor, the city mayor, your delegation, and, uh, everybody's been involved there. Yes, sir. During the breakup of the Soviet Union, political refugees were put on fast track to citizenship. Is that happening now? Come to the ones that were coming here. If they're political refugees back in the breakup of the Soviet Union, I had clients that were fast tracked. <coughs> here it's five years. Here you, when the average, I'm sure there's different exceptions for different refugees, but the average refugee, as soon as they get here legally, lawfully, they become immediately work eligible. They, they're eligible for uh, Social Security, they're eligible for all kinds of benefits, etc., and they're also on a five year track. To citizenship. Is that different than a bit of political refugee seeking political asylum? Could be. I, I just couldn't answer. I that. don't know either. Someone seeking political asylum may be granted, could be granted by executive authority. I just don't know. Well, if I were the guy in the White House, which I'm glad I'm not, I'd bring those guys to the swing state, make them citizens quickly so they can start voting. Well, that's, <coughs> you nailed it. That's yeah. where they're coming. They're coming to Tennessee, they're going to Alabama, they're going to places where We've got these 47 or these 49 to 51 percent margins, and the only way they're going to be able to win is, and 47 percent of the people are already roughly on an entitlement now. 
you put it on the <coughs> of million voters on an entitlement mentality into the system, they've crested the 50% consistently. And they've taken, they've taken good conservative states like Tennessee and they've, they've ripped us apart. I mean, we've got, if you look at the papers today, we've got Democrats and Republicans in Tennessee fighting over bringing Syrian <coughs> refugees here. Why would not everybody want to stop them? Mm -hmm. And not bring them. I mean, it's just stupid. It's stupid. Well, I, I understand if you're any kind of immigrant, but if you're illegal, they can get a four thousand dollar earned income credit from the federal government. But plus, you know, Madrid of other things. Well, and it's a big racket. The, the, the charities that are bringing these folks in are making an extraordinary amount of money, and they're not just making money off the heads that they bring in, but they're making all kinds of money off other donations that go to support these individuals. And they're, they're funneling money to refugees for gift cards and private cash donations and all kinds of things to keep them their income eligibility low enough so they can still receive their free housing in the same year. And it's an absolute bracket. The people that are participating in are increasing some steps. And look at the next bunch of them. Uh, if, if anybody brought up the idea of uh, the young men that's coming over here, that's of uh, the uh, age that they can participate in, There may be some talk about that, but I haven't heard a bit about it. I've just heard a lot of criticism that there's too many that look like they're old enough to be able to fight. But I haven't heard of any concerted effort to, you know, build a division of them or anything like that. But I wonder if it's like when I started to grow more than gray. City. We also have the uh, largest population of Kurds outside of Iraq. We have over 20,000, probably 25,000 Kurds. We have one of the largest Egyptian populations, and most of them are Coptic Christian, but they're Egyptian. Uh, in and around Antioch, we have pockets of Somalis um, all over the place. We probably have 8,000 Somalis in the state now. Chill, chill. 
lot of them in Shelby. Yeah, well, At one time, there were about 800 in Shelby. <coughs> Is that why we got a uh, Democratic mayor in Nashville? Well, she loves it. Yeah. Yeah. She loves it. She, she'd just like to get it. She'd like all serious going on. Why is Aslan, why does he refuse to block? Why does he, why does he just want to play around with the feds and stuff? Because you can't vet people you don't have in your FBI database. The director's already said that. Why, why is he not? Uh, primarily, um, he's generally a weak individual. He's, he's generally uh, uh, not willing to take the, the reins and fight. Just like all day yesterday, we encouraged him to, and, and it was half a day a day before he finally joined the fight. He had to let 13 other states <coughs> do the same thing. When we all told him this had to be done anyway, he won't do anything um, up front and up first. And Tennessee, to me, is a state that should be leading in this. That's right. And I think we've been leading for a long time legislatively on identifying the problem, trying to do something about it. And states are going to have to lead us out of this. It's not going to be that. We're not going to be able to ask the federal government for an answer. We're going to have to just do it. And uh, you, you wait till one of these, you wait till one of these guys gets on, gets on a school bus and kills 40 kids. Mm -hmm. And that happens three different times in 10 minutes. That's so all over with now. But the cat's out of the bag. You know, you have to get Trump's deportation squad, which is possible, but we have football stadiums to start with. Competition, who really is in charge of, of bringing people in? I mean, is it the federal government or is it the state? Really, who is <coughs> um, a true constitutionalist will tell you that the states uh -huh. are the true immigration authorities. Uh -huh. um, the federal government has accepted that power over the over the over the years, the states are the true immigration authorities. What goes on within those solid borders of those states is ultimately up to those states. <coughs> yes, sir. Has the governor not been consistent with his bill of legislation passing something and it went into effect without his signature? How many times does that happen? That's happened quite a bit. It's usually on issues like this. It's usually issues that have to do with immigrants and refugees and firearms and things. Well, he's good at the and defense. Yeah. Only if he has to. Yeah, he does yeah. everything he can <coughs> not to let a bill get into his desk. It's, it's just, I hate to say those things about him, guys, but these are tough times. Mm -hmm. He does many good things from a fiduciary standpoint. Uh, he really does, but he's, he fails to see these serious issues we have that are truly going to be fatal to, to this country if we don't deal with them. I think we have a very different timeline on how to deal with those. Do you think any of the emails from the citizens of the state help sway him? That works a lot. I know he got inundated yesterday. Yeah. He got inundated. To letters or email work. Yeah. It, either, either way. Oh, I used to hear in the letters were in Washington even better, but maybe that's because letters were stronger back then. Just let it keep it polite, keep it short, and just say, you know, this, we've got too many domestic problems to worry about finding somebody else's. But guys, thank you very much, and I'll try to hang around here for a little while. One more question. What do you, what do you think about uh, Missouri complaining today that the happenings in Paris they took the news media over without being in their situation, their problems? They're out of the news now. <laughs> oh, I'm complaining about it. Uh, I'm <laughs> um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about, but they'll just have to burn another CPS over there. <laughs> Get something going. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Judge.